Hey everyone, welcome back to Linux Weekly, Daily Wednesdays, where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source and pretty much anything else we find interesting. I'm Vin, that's Jill, watching us live at home. Normally we're doing it on Twitch, just not this week because Twitch kind of Twitch exploded. Yeah. But an hour or two hours before the show that uh, on Twitch, like some people are having problems connecting. I was like, I better make uh, contingency plans for that. So we're using our little backup uh, Linux Gamecast Uncut channel, which you might even like, what? What are you talking about? Our fault. I never promote it. If you're worried, uh, like thinking about where's the live and uncut versions of the shows, those go out the same day for patrons. But a week later, we put them on our Linux Gamecast Uncut page. So if you know where our YouTube page is, just scroll down to the bottom. It's right there on the uh, recommended channels. You can get everything yourself after the fact. But we're still live. We were just waiting around <laughs> in the pre-show. Like some people are going to figure this out, yeah. Because uh, <laughs> you know it's an unlisted live stream, posted it in all the places, and you know I, I still don't know if Steve's figured it out yet. But <laughs> he did, he did. You know what? To uh, poor Stephen, he's having issues with Discord on his cell phone. So I think that's what happened. He couldn't scroll back and get the link. <laughs> Steve, you need to get an iPhone, an iPhone fourteen. <laughs> It'll be great. It'll never break. And if you mess it up, Joel will tell you, not her problem. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> which is which is the correct response. When somebody brings you a MacBook, they're like, I don't know anything about that. Get it out of here. Bye. Shoot. Go take the Mac store. Um, but speaking of you and Steve, you guys are uh, doing the 26 years, right? Yeah. It's our 26th wedding anniversary this weekend. Uh, so we are we are headed once again to one of our pay- favorite places in the world, Disneyland. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to Disneyland two days, and then we're going to take two days off to just hang out with each other and chill out and go to a nice dinner and do some fun stuff. <laughs> right on, right on. Um, <laughs> I'm working around. I finally get everything together. Got all the pieces to click. If you follow me in Discord, I always like put that up. I finished the definitive guide on how to set up MIDI, USB MIDI control surfaces under Linux. Like, we're just gonna cover everything in this. We're gonna be nice. covering Reaper, we're gonna cover Outdoor, we're gonna show you how to set it up to Jack. We're gonna show you how to use Mackie mode, which is predefined with the scroll wheels. We're gonna show you how to use MIDI CC, how to teach a MIDI device to dance around. Like Even if you're not, just tune in because I can make the faders move with a mouse and that's pretty cool, right? Mm-hmm. And on top of that, make sure everything's accurate and get it in under 10 minutes. You know, it's not, Oh man, I'm. These things frustrate me when I I ran into that <laughs> Monday. I was looking for some information for DaVinci Resolve. I needed an expression. I needed to punch in a math equation into DaVinci Resolve to get a specialized timeline. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe this twelve second point to where this guy had this information was in a forty seven minute long video. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Lots of scrolling. <laughs> Fast forwarding. <laughs> skip it around, skip it around. And he even says, oh, yeah. Oh, if you just tuned in for this part. I'm like, what were you talking? I didn't go back and listen, but I was uh, almost impressed. It's like, how do you fill like almost an hour for that one little bit of information? Um, I That stuff drives me crazy. So, yeah, all that information I'm going to be dumping in your face in about 10 minutes. Plus, if you um, I don't have it with me right now, it's in another room. Got a new interface. It's pretty neat. It's pretty awesome. It's got EQ built in compression and stuff like that. Most importantly, it's got a nice GUI that normal people can use. Um, go to be doing a thing on that. Get a thing on Firewire coming in. Get another thing on OBS about setting up Jack, some more advanced things that you could be able to do. Bunch of stuff in the works right now. If you want to see that MIDI video, it's currently in our Discord under the announcements section, but it'll be up for patrons uh, this afternoon when I log into Patreon and cool. post everything for that. But yeah. Let's get in. Pretty boring week. Nothing happened yesterday or the day before. Oh that. boy, what a week it's been for for hardware tech and and good things for Linux. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. Um, I think it's fair to say that AMD has uh, released some new hotness. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> which I wasn't paying attention to when that embargo lifted. I just know everyone knows that morning when you open. Um, like your mobile device or whatever, you have notifications. And I saw the YouTube notifications from yeah. the tech tubers. And I'm like, well, I guess that got released, which it was immediately followed by how many videos are they going to try to milk out of this? So we're on like day three of videos of like 
people are starting to have to get creative. Yeah, and, um, yeah. <laughs> like, how, how do I make yet another video about the um, 7950X or the 7600X? Hmm. But hey, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, I'm just curious if you're a tech tuber and you happen to have that, put a Hyper 212 on it. I want to see how quick or how fast you can run it. Ah, yes. <laughs> right? I want to see the uh, the one heat sink that I've had for years. Since the bulldozer <laughs> days of and AM4 compatibility still works and can it handle? The new hotness from AMD. Ars Technica did a pretty decent write up on it, going over everything from the 7000 series. And yeah, no joke, these are absolutely uh, a little bit warm. They can happily run at, brace yourself for this, 90C. And that's a temperature that would normally signal cooling failure on the current gen of AMD CPUs. Now, AMD says that they're going to add a eco mode to the BIOS later on, which, you know, You'll be able to take like 105 watt part. It'll drop it down to like 65 watt TDP or 170 watt will come down to like 105 TDP. And uh, we only got two options. We got the top of the line out of the gate. I mean, you got 7950X at 699. And of course the 7600X, you know, 7950X is 16 cores, 7600's uh, six core, 12 thread, I think at 299. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're hot, but they're fast, Joe. Yeah. They're really, really fast. In some cases, uh, 30 to 40% faster on workloads. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, that's on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, what what I think is also cool is that not, not this, just that they're performant and uh, um, are much faster, but they do, of course, run a little hotter is what's interesting is the 7000 series also comes with uh, igpus which are not as powerful as their apus amd's apus but are good for light work and, and actually light gaming i've seen a, a couple of the tech tubers testing that out and honestly this is actually quite convenient to test out a new system without a gpu or to use the new ryzen's for uh, server side applications so I think it was a good choice of them to include an iGPU. Makes things a lot easier. You got to throw something in there, and, and to what you yeah. said there is that that is strictly there to cut a display on. So yeah, yeah, like absolutely. The, these things are criminally underpowered, even compared to I uh, think like Intel iGPUs before the uh, Z. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the current ones right now can kind of play a game sort of if you squint, but yeah, these things think of them as just display only, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it it AMD says this that these chips maintain compatibility with the AM4 based CPU coolers you're already using, but yes, you do. It does require a shim for a height. So, uh, me and Ven were talking early, uh, before the show started. I guess other manufacturers will probably have to manufacture some shims, or you can three D print run. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That'll if be you, interesting. Uh... If you have a uh, 3D printer that can do uh, print metal, go for it. Uh, Outside yeah. of that, I would advise against uh, 3D printing uh, <laughs> Cause, cause plastic I, shim for your metal heat sink. That probably yeah, wouldn't be very thermally it would melt. conductive. They so, would melt uh, unless you have access to a million dollar 3D printer, which most people don't. <laughs> um, maybe get access to a CNC, but yeah, don't 3D print yeah. your shims, kids. Plastic is not really thermally <laughs> conductive. Now, that was the only thing we got this week. On top of that, we got a, finally, finally. Now, I tried to watch it, but Intel had the, um, what does Intel call their thing? Arc Alchemist? <laughs> no, no, no. The, the entire show they did yesterday. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the Intel Innovation. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I was trying to find a decent stream of it, and uh, like, two guys uh i ended up watching a, a korean gentleman who was doing a fairly good job and he had subtitles on because this other guy was doing a stream and he was like dead silent for like 15 20 minutes at a time and i'm just chilling out and i'm like listening and then he'll go yeah and like scream out of nowhere and oh no it hurt your like, ears I'm like what yeah. are you doing man like <laughs> just have a thing but the only thing i cared about was this um Finally yes. announcing the Alchemist graphics pricing. Yes. That got me excited. <laughs> maybe. Yes. Maybe it got me excited. Joe, what do you think? Yeah, so I think uh, actually 
they they announced that a seventy seven is set a the a seven seventy will cost three hundred and twenty nine dollars, and uh, they actually said AMD said their flagship version was going to have sixteen gigabytes of memory. If that's true, at three hundred twenty nine dollars, that's a darn good deal. But I'm thinking that might be the eight gig version, and the sixteen gig version would be higher. <laughs> <laughs> so I I'm even even if they're under five hundred dollars for a sixteen gigabyte version, that's still better than the choices we have at N Nvidia and AMD uh, for sixteen gigabytes on a card. So it's still cheaper, and you know I'm excited because Intel GPUs are one of the best open source options for the Linux community. And what was so exciting exciting about the Intel Innovation event is that Linus Torvalds himself was present on stage for the announcement. And that is rare indeed. <laughs> Linus usually only makes one convention a year uh, for Open Source Summit at the Linux Foundation event. So <laughs> this was... This was pretty important that our our Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, was on stage with the the CEO of Intel. It's pretty sweet. Mm. <laughs> Couple of things we got going on though. Now, <laughs> I talked about this on Saturday. More towards what AMD should be thinking about doing because we had the Nvidia forty series announcement, and I talked about that last week. Those prices were just crazy. You know. You're looking mm -hmm. at, you know, $1,500 for a yeah. video card. Not, this, this video card doesn't even come with like a concierge service or anything. It's just a video card. You get a video card, like, I don't know. I'm not going <laughs> to, you know, uh, uh, we just get done with like two and a half years, three years of scalper pricing and um, mm -mm, not going to happen. I was thinking if AMD came in with the RDNA 3 announcement, which is going to be November 3rd of this year, come in and they say, hey, we're going to release our top of the line video card, like $500, $600, and maybe it's going to compete. Now, Intel's a little bit different because we know the A770, mm -hmm. 16 gig or 8 gig. Intel's already came out and said, they're like, hey, you know what? If we're lucky and everything works right, this thing's going to kind of sort of trade blows with an NVIDIA 3060 non-TI. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Problem is, is, you can get a 3060 non TI for under 300 bucks. Yeah, that's true. And if the price is 329 ends up being for the 8 gig, that means you have a card that costs more than a 3060 with less memory. Yeah, that's true. But if it's the 16, that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> that might be interesting. Yeah. But on top of that, you got to deal with being the early adopter and you're going to be dealing with those Intel drivers. So it's not like a card that you can just pick up and start slamming into production. It's like, eh, maybe, but you know, 329, if that is the 16 gig model. Yeah. Maybe. Sweet. <laughs> maybe. Might yeah. pick it up. If you're going to end up, if you're trying to get 329 for an 8 gig model in 2022, good luck. Yeah. I mean, no one <laughs> outside of collectors. I think would be picking that up. And I think it's best like right now, just sit back and wait for the yard and wait until no November mm -hmm. and see what AMD brings to the table. Buy one of these, like 329 is so close, but I know. Why, did, why, why did you have to be Intel? Intel, why can't you just say which one that is? Yeah, I know. I know. Intel's being Intel. <laughs> I mean, we, and if that's the 16 gig ver version, then I, I say Intel, take my money. Well, <laughs> that's I, easy money. <laughs> I almost want to say, I guarantee you, it's not the 16 gig version because if it was, they would have said that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think you might be right about that. They, they would have said, you can get the 16 gig version for 329. You're like, you know what, Intel? Here's 329. I won't play around with that. Intel's like, we're trying to get $329 for a card that, doesn't always even compete, much less beat, uh, you know, two and a half, three year old NVIDIA product with less memory. Yeah. And what's Intel going to do? What's Intel going to do with the uh, 3060s? They're like, you know what? They're going to be 300 bucks, something like that. They're going to get a new MSRP or whatever, because NVIDIA's got a bunch of wiggle room on that. 
Mm-hmm. And it's it's old stuff in video wants to sell 40 series anyway. At least you got them to the market intel. Hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. <sighs> and you know, I think if if that if the 16 gig card is even only a hundred dollars more, that's still worth it because I'm looking at getting an AMD RX 6900X, and it's you know uh, priced at 700, and that's below MSRP. So, and that's a 16 gig card. So. <laughs> but you're going to be getting a 16 gig card for like gaming though, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's for gaming. Yeah. And, uh, 4k, <laughs> 4k gaming. <laughs> I have to just sit back and wait. Cause you don't know. Like, yeah. I don't know. Like we don't know. This is a, a big uncertainties. Uh, stay tuned. We're just going to mm-hmm. have to watch this. Yes. <laughs> this is going to be interesting. I, I want to buy one. <laughs> I want to buy one. You know, at the end of the day, I might just pick up because really the only thing I want from the Intel card, I would love to have a very complete 16 gig package, but I'm still waiting on things like um, DaVinci Resolve to see what mm. they're going to do with the AV1 encoding because none of that's made it into the beta channel or anything. Yeah. So until I have that in place and I can see like, and then we got to wait on things like Twitch and we got to wait on things like YouTube for the AV1 support, which I was kind of hoping would be ready for launch, but. Hey, maybe by the time October rolls around when the 40 series comes out, we'll start seeing some stuff take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. Now, modular Chromebooks. Why would you yeah. want a Chromebook, Joel? So, do you want a Chromebook that you can play Steam on? Nope. <laughs> no? Okay. Well, <laughs> Ven might not be, uh, not have the same opinion as some other people on that. <laughs> but, well, then, you know, you have... We have a new Framework Laptop Chromebook Edition as a great option. Yes, uh, Framework, the company Framework, well known for its modular, upgradable, and sustainable laptops, has teamed up with Google Google to bring you Chrome OS on a laptop. (laughs) And this kind of came out of nowhere. I wasn't expecting this. So the the Framework Laptop uh, Chromebook Edition has a 12th gen Intel Core i5 1240p processor with a 4 plus 8 CPU cores, 8 gigs of memory, which of course can be upgradable, and Iris XE graphics, and 256 gigabytes of storage. So much more powerful than your average Chromebook. (laughs) And the laptop is up for pre-order starting at $9.99 $9.99 for U.S. and Canada only, with shipments expected to begin in early December. So I'm sure their worldwide shipping will come soon after that. So this, the, I was pretty impressed by this. <laughs> it's nice to have framework with the mod, modularity of a framework laptop with Chrome OS. It's just kind of strange. <laughs> I'm kind of into that. I'm kind of yeah. into that. I'm playing around on the website right now. And I just, you know, initially... You know what, everyone? Initially, I was like, all right, hey, you know what? Framework, I like what they're doing in the laptop space. Hopefully, like, Google cut them a decent check to get this announced and put all this together. And I'm not necessarily going to hate on it because I'm like, hey, if I had to buy a Chromebook, this would be the only one I would buy. But I'm never, you know, it's easy for me to say that. I would never be in that position. Why? Because you can't upgrade it, and I'm not a fan of disposable hardware. However... I just had a big womp mm-hmm. womp because okay. I went looking around on the framework website to customize my $999 Chromebook. And of course, can you install Linux on it? Yes, you can. Christini. However, can I upgrade my CPU later? We haven't announced any plans for a new or Chrome OS compatible mainboard at this time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to which <laughs> so- I was like, how is this thing not? How is this necessarily different? Because it's got some modules on it. See that? That yeah. worries me right there. Because like, yeah. uh, do you have uh, plans in the future, maybe, to do something with it? I don't know. Um, at nine ninety nine, I would basically need to know that in advance. Like, is there an upgrade path for this later on if I want to do something with it mm, for nine hundred ninety nine yeah. bucks? Because you can get an amazingly overpowered Chromebook for 500 bucks. And the other framework book laptops allow you to, you know, you upgrade a frame- to a yeah, new motherboard. You, you, you know? get a framework laptop for like $900 too. I'm like, why yeah. would I, why, why would I get this again? The, the Chromebook version. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, I don't know. Somebody write in. Let me know. Um, yeah. <laughs> framework. Make me a tablet. That is uh, one that's thing. That's what Ven needs. Yes. That's what I want. I, yeah. I have yet to put a tablet in the landfill, but no joke. You know, I've got a stack of tablets that are not usable, and I use them like to the point of like, what does this tablet do? This one powers the RGB lighting. It, it has just enough power in 2022 to launch the app to power the RGB lighting. I have other tablets that are just relegated to running Discord or something like that. I I hate throwing out. I hate e-waste. I hate that idea. Mm-hmm. Not being yeah. able to keep something in service longer. And I think a lot of you at home are probably exactly like me. I would love to have something that, you know, it doesn't have to be 10 inch, you know, it could be like 13. Yeah. Me personally, I would like 17 inch, but something that was modular that I could, you know, swap the guts out of a little bit, you know, pop off the back, swap out a new made board because like, have we seen any major advancements in screen technology after like, you know, retina 2k, whatever you want to call yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> no. Uh. Uh-uh. And actually one of the things I've been Wanting is a, a, a little mini computer that's uh, modular that framework could possibly make. Maybe that's in a, in the plans down the road, but I think that's a great idea also. <laughs> and don't listen to anybody because I know somebody's like uh, thinking, like, <laughs> "Hey, framework, make sure that the tablet has a full size." Z-. Just ignore that person, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's always that one person, no matter what the device is, is like, "I need a full size Ethernet." I'm like, "No, you don't. Just use Wi-Fi. Grow up." Now, I'm sure a lot of you have contributed to open source projects without even knowing it, because maybe you filed a bug report, maybe you shared a tweet. All those things can help Mm -hmm. open source projects. And that's why I like dragging this out every now and then. And this has been recently updated on uh, September, non-code contributions to open source. Now, this does a good job of just kind of walking through some things, Matt. Yeah. It does. Uh, because you absolutely positively do not need to be a developer in order to help out the open source projects that you use each and every day, or just Linux in general. I mean, contributing just documentations, translations. If you want to do bug reports, these are things you can help projects with writing, fixing, polishing, install guides. That's a huge one for me. I mean, that's <laughs> something that I've been doing publicly for the last 12 years. Now, hey, there's more than one GitHub repo. That links back to Linux Emcast because I made a guide. Mm-hmm. Try to, you know, just set it up, make it real easy for somebody to read through, copy pasta, and get up to speed on their project. And you know what? The downside to that, I don't see it as a downside. Here's the reality of it. Doing stuff like that, that is not sexy work. You're never going to become a YouTube famous tuber or whatever, <laughs> or a TikTok star. But it needs to be done. Yeah. And um, <laughs> hey, more people need to help out with it if you can if you got time if it's something you're interested in because another thing you can do is show people how you use projects in your workflow you know and like hey i do use this and here's a way that i found that it works into my production chain and yeah do that write good really good bug reports but also when i say that have empathy for the developers don't show up on github don't show up anywhere else and just say this thing's broken it's stupid fix it yeah. No. Help them no. test it and give them, you know, file bug reports. Exactly. And be nice yeah. about it. And I'm not saying, you know, like, hey, I found an issue with this and this and this and this. And don't, don't be very demandy, especially about something that uh, you're not buying, you're not paying for. Support projects financially if you can. But here's another one, though. Mm-hmm. I've harped on this and I will continue harping on this because people. Tr- with good intentions in their heart can be extremely destructive to open source projects or just Linux in general. I mean, this is something that I've run across for three decades now, and that that's your cheerleaders. That are are the people that will run out and say, Linux is great. Linux is perfect. Open source is great. Open source is perfect. There's no flaws or anything like that. They're delusional. Um, They, to give a good example, this is what I put on the show. You know, don't blindly tell somebody that the GIMP is going to do everything Photoshop does. Yeah. It doesn't. it doesn't. Don't blindly tell somebody that KDN Live will replace, you know, uh, After Effects. It will replace um, DaVinci Resolve. It won't. Now, notice I left Blender out now. Blender kind of will, man. Uh, you can yeah. walk in and be like, you know what? 
It you, will. Might, you might have to change your workflow going from Maya or something like that. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, you know, Blender's kind of there. But be realistic because nothing can turn somebody off. And not necessarily the Linux users, but somebody getting familiar with open source project is being sold a false bill of goods. Like I was told this is going to do all this stuff and I can just swap it out. They install it and their first experience is like, this thing doesn't do what I was told it does. Why, why did you tell me it does all that? And like I said, cheerleading can be toxic as well. That's what I'm saying. Just keep that in mind. Be honest with people, be honest. And that's something I've always done. And it's irritated some people because, you know, treat an open source project like you would treat anything else. Point out the good parts, point out the bad parts, you know, don't harp on them because, hey, you know, it's somebody's project, but don't pretend they don't exist. Yeah. Because you're not helping anybody by doing that. How about you, Joe? You got some- Good point. Yeah, good point, Vin. And yeah, you know, he, I, I think yearly we bring up a, um, a a really good article about this on how you can tr- contribute to open source, th- source without contributing to code. And uh, this article in, in particular, Venn found, and it's actually very thoughtful and thorough with uh, on so many ideas on ways to contribute. One, of course, is uh, one way is documentation. They always need uh, people to write documentation. And you can contribute with artwork, whether it be on the website or social media or for the application icon. Uh, you can contribute uh, with alpha and beta testing, like we were talking about earlier, and then file bug reports for the the project and developers. You can also help out with mentoring, you know, helping new users uh, use that uh, software project or uh, learn how to code with it, or if you need help with uh, learning how to do documentation or artwork or or any area that you want to contribute with open source, having a mentor can be very, very beneficial. I, I've done that role myself for several open source projects. And uh, also writing articles and tutorials like Ven was talking about. And, you know, maybe making a YouTube tutorial videos uh, like Ven does. Yeah, he does Interfacing Linux, the audio tutorials that are wonderful for our community. And the other way is you can um, advocate and advertise, letting users know about your project. And that's kind of what, you know, me and Ven here do on LWW every week. Uh, That's kind of our contribution to the open source community is getting the word out about all these wonderful projects that are out there. I don't know. I just drag everything over the coals, Joe. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying like, but what if you like the project? Then I'm going to be extra hard on it, especially yeah. if I use it. Um, <laughs> speaking of press things, I mean, if you see a project, like become the unofficial, you know, a spokesperson for it. Start sharing their news post. You know, how many times have I, like, oh, mm-hmm. this is a great project. This is good together. Like, do you have a social media presence? None. Like, you know what? Now you do. I'm going to start mm-hmm. making sure that your news posts and stuff go out and stuff like that. And that's very important. And of course, there's always like financial support and things along those lines, any way that you can to keep the ecosystem. Because I tell you, it's very important. Like just that little bit of, um, you know, somebody does file an issue or somebody has a suggestion or a pull request, little things like that can like just make your day. You're like, yeah. Oh, hey, you know, and it, it, it's, like somebody cares like that's fantastic that's wonderful so absolutely in fact a lot of the open source projects they get you know the developers get so depressed because all they hear you know sometimes all they hear is is negative you know feedback and just sending out you know a nice tweet saying i love your project i'm using it every day and, and enjoying it really lifts nice their spirits and keeps them you know keeps keeps them motivated to do, to do the project so I'm saying have some empathy because, yeah. you know, there's a human being behind that project that you use. Yeah. Keep that in mind. Keep <laughs> that in mind. But what do we got? Uh, we're going to be talking about drones. Yeah. High power drones. But before we do that, I want to remind everybody that we 
are sponsored by you at home helping us out mm-hmm. patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. We got a bunch of things in there as thank you notes. If you can kick us a buck a week, a thousand bucks a week, ten thousand dollars a week, don't do it. You know what? If you do that, mm-hmm. don't tell anyone. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Aww. including me uh i'm really bad about stuff like that now uh we got a couple of bonus things you get access to our discord we do an extra hour of content each and every week pre pre super shows and behind the scenes things like that i'm going to be putting up the everything you've thought about asking about midi control surfaces and things like that being set up under linux that's going to be going out for patrons kind of an early crack it's not a final video it's a little bit of a snack pick. I'm like, hey, look this over. Do you see any errors or get an idea? Because I solicit community feedback inside of that before it goes public. And uh, yeah, just a bunch of stuff like that. So yeah, if you can, patreon.com forward slash links, Gamecast. We got a store. Oh, you know what? I'm going to mm-hmm. point this out. Check this out. I, I'm horrible about this, but I had a great interaction last night with Unoid and Discord. Um, he was like, hey. Vin, do you get any suggestions for, I'm thinking about doing a podcast or like, I don't think he said podcast, but like home studio recording type setup, microphone. And, you know, he'd come up with like a little list and I looked over and I'm like, Hey, you know why I have this knowledge stuck in my head. I don't, I'm like, Oh no, that interface is using the dice three chipset and that AD converter doesn't initialize properly under LC. I know things like that. I don't know why I know it, but so I pointed out. I think M. Fox Dog said, why don't you use the list? And I'm like, yeah, there's a, uh, if you go to linuxteamcast.com, you go to the about section. I can't think of a better place to put this. Studio equipment. Everything we have in the studio. If you're looking for audio stuff, you click on these mm-hmm. big, ugly, um, horrific headphones that I have to wear sometimes. Yeah. We got headphones. <laughs> we got all the microphones. Like there's Jill's microphone right there, the little mm-hmm. Aston. And all the interfaces, all the audio stuff. Same way, there's control surfaces, preamps. And I'm not saying buy it on Amazon. Buy it used. Buy your audio equipment used if you can. GuitarCenter.com. I don't get any kickback from that. But, you know, keep stuff out of landfills. <laughs> but, yeah, do that. We got a store. All the other fun places. Uh, come say hi. If you want to chat with us live, normally we're on Twitch. We have an IRC channel. All that information is available on the uh, live description on our web soon. But, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, hi, I'm going to talk about Raspberry Pi Power Drums. Before that, though, Ven, we got to thank Basil for increasing his pledge. Thank you, Basil. <laughs> He's been with us for a, a very long time. So thank you as so you much. you might know, Basil as uh, Basil Super X. Death Stout. Yeah, Super Death Stout. <laughs> Stout. 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 We'll get there. <laughs> all right. Now, all 3DP. High-powered drones. I've thought about this a couple of times. Um, What I've thought about is just drones in general, because I've somehow managed to make it this long without buying a drone. And you know what? That's for the best. It really is. It really is. But if you're into do-it-yourself type stuff, like all those aerial shenanigans, find a good place to start, especially since it fit really nicely into our Raspberry Pi section. This (laughs) has just a big chalky list of all the questions that you would ever think about when setting up a Pi Power drone. And it's a great place to get started because it covers all the components, uh, like the batteries, the motors, the frames, GPS, propellers, remotes, and camera, everything you need Yeah. to spend a couple <laughs> hundred dollars building a drone only to have it crash on the top of your house after 10 seconds on its first flight. <laughs> that just, hmm, see... Now, even talking about this. It even has a Raspberry Pi on it. Right? (laughs) Raspberry Pi logo, I should say. (laughs) It's got Raspberry Pi in it, though. Yeah, it does. It sure does. And what I think was cool, Ven, is he went into the different kits you can buy, like the the PixHawk, Raspberry Pi drone. And that's actually a, a kit that you can build, and then you put a Raspberry Pi in it. And some of the kits are Raspberry Pi 4, use Raspberry Pi 4s, or some use Raspberry Pi 0s. So you can have either option. And we're talking about like even setting it up the GPS modules too. Yeah, that that was in, that's impressive. <laughs> Batteries and yeah, see I look at this and fortunately I have uh, power distribution boards. I mean, the, this this is good telemetry. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, we're not too far off of like, yes, you can probably do some autonomous stuff and that is available. It's a, uh, it's a responsibility thing. There's a reason I no longer own a motorcycle and there's a reason I have never mm-hmm. bought a drone. I'm not responsible enough to own one, but if you are, or if at least you would like to test the theory that you are, this is be in the show notes. Um, this is all 3dp.com. Mm-hmm. All the Raspberry Pi drone simply explained. And yeah, plus you look at something like that and you're thinking, but man, that could be a money pit. So if you're looking to light some yeah. money on fire, <laughs> that yeah. could be fun. All right. Uh, hey, we're at 35. We got to run. Okay. <laughs> Let me get that together and we're going to. Yeah, this has been a fun show full of hardware. Lots of hardware that I want. <laughs> Definitely. <sighs> you kids with your fancy things, I want like a five-year-old epic CPU. Arr, get off my lawn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I just uh, picked up a five-year-old uh, iMac. <laughs> so, And I've been enjoying it to have it for my vintage computer collection. In the future, it'll be vintage. <laughs> so... It's pre-vintage. Oh, you mean it's yes. modern? No, pre-vintage. <laughs> pre-vintage, yes. Get it right. Do you even vintage, bro? Yeah. <laughs> but it, it games pretty nicely, and it runs Vulcan. So <laughs> I was pretty happy about that. <laughs> all right, lovely people. 345 is over. See you next week. Okay. Back on Twitch, Love hopefully. You all. Yeah, back on Twitch next week. <laughs>